was wondering, as I'm looking through, as I'm scanning through, I noticed it contains the Deuterocanonical book. Yep. And I was wondering, since the Septuagint is what Jesus and all them in the early church Uh, used, were those included back then, or were those added for our edition today? Well, of course, we do not have any complete Septuagints from the days of Jesus. We have fragments, we have singular books. We have portions in the Dead Sea Scrolls and things like that. That is, that's not so much a Septuagint question as it is a canon question. In older, in older materials, you will read about the Palestinian canon and the Alexandrian canon. And the assumption was many years ago that the Palestinian Jews had a different canon than the Alexandrian Jews, that the Palestinian Jews had what we would have in the Protestant canon, and that the Alexandrian Jews had an expanded canon that included the Deuterocanonicals. I would recommend a a book, it's getting older now, it's getting up to 40 years, but it's still uh, fairly relevant along these lines, and uh, that is the Old Testament canon, New Testament church by Roger Beckwith, and it's very scholarly, but he really goes in depth in refuting the idea, and most scholars who study this area today no longer hold that there were two different canons. There was only one Jewish canon, and that the Jewish people never embraced those Deuterocanonical books as canon scripture. So the what's, what's obvious, and this will become obvious once you've learned enough Greek to be really doing much with, with that nice uh, two volumes that you've got, is that the certain portions of the Greek Septuagint were translated at very high levels. So the Pentateuch is excellent. It's very, really, really well done. There are a couple other se- sections that are really, really well done. And then there are other sections that are not really well done at all. And what that means is the Septuagint was not translated by one group at one time. It came into existence over a period of time. And so what would have been the form early on, or even in the days of Jesus, and then our earliest versions that would give us an idea of what was contained altogether come from three to four hundred, about three hundred years after after the days of Christ. So, in Palestine, obviously, in Israel, in that geographical location, all the evidence is that the Jewish people did not accept these as uh, canonical. They were not laid up in the temple, and so whatever. Because, see, we, we always think of the Septuagint as a, as a single volume, something that we can just grab hold of. This is my Rolf's uh, Septuagint here. And so when we think of the Septuagint, we think of something like this, a, a single volume. It, it almost never existed like this. Um, this is a modern innovation. The, the vast majority of them, well, first of all, they would have been on scrolls in, mm-hmm. in the ancient world. And then once Christians started utilizing them, Christians just... Maybe it was so that they could differentiate themselves from the, from the synagogue. There's a lot of different theories about this, but Christians just didn't do scrolls. They didn't like doing scrolls. And so once you start getting codex versions, then those books start getting uh, collected together and included within the Tanakh in Christian versions, because we do know that by the time of the Council of Nicaea and, and that time onward, not only was the Septuagint become the Bible of the early church, but those books were being included within the uh, the canon of the Old Testament at that point, which led to the initial controversies concerning whether those books were considered canonical or not. So as early as Melito Sardis uh, in the second century, there is controversy being discussed as to whether those books are to be considered canonical or not. He makes inquiries into Israel, discovers the Jews have never accepted them, and so he rejects them. Uh, Jerome does the same thing, and so Jerome does not translate the Deuterocanonicals for the Latin Vulgate until the very last, and you can tell he didn't do a very good job because he did not believe that they were, in fact, a a canon scripture. Uh, He and Augustine argue about the subject because in North Africa they are accepted as canon scripture, they argue about the subject, and it's interesting. One of Augustine's arguments is that he thinks that they were a part of the Hebrew canon. Well, he was wrong. And mm-hmm. so if it had the right information about that, if he had access to the, the sources Jerome did, Jerome was in Bethlehem, for crying out loud. He, he, he had access to all Jewish scholars he wanted to talk to, but mm-hmm. Augustine did not in Hippo. So 
uh, if he had had access to that, he would have had to have taken a different perspective. So down through history, there are two streams as to the deuterocanonical books. And that continues all the way to the time of the Reformation, and that's found amongst popes. Uh, Pope Gregory the Great rejected the deuterocanonical books as being canonical. Uh, all the way down to the days of Cardinal Cayetan, who was the one who interviewed Luther, and he had written a commentary on the Bible, which rejected, he, he had read Jerome, so he rejected the deuterocanonical books. And when Trent canonized them formally in April of 1546, you don't have a bunch of scholars there sifting through ancient materials to come to a conclusion. They are reacting against Luther's rejection of those books. They don't answer what Cayetan had said or what anybody else had said. They just simply are re reacting to, uh, to Luther. So when you get your earliest Septuagint copies today, they're Christian. They're not Jewish. Okay. And though they, th so they do contain them. But th as to what the Jews would have had, there's no reason to believe that in the days of Jesus in Israel, that there would have been scrolls of those books that would have, uh, the term that they used was to make the hands dirty, that they would have considered holy from touching them because they just, they were never laid up in the temple. And that was even 200 years, 200 years before Christ, the canonical books of the Tanakh, which we would call the 39 books, they numbered them 22 to 24 because they did not separate out the minor prophets. They were all one book. And then some of the major prophets included some of the, like Lamentations was in Jeremiah, so on and so forth. They had 22 to 24 books, same list that we have today. They were laid up in the temple and were considered to make the hands dirty because they were, they were holy. That's never the case with the deuterocanonical books. They're, they're just never treated okay. that way. And in fact, when you read them, you discover that they recognized the threefold canon of the Hebrew Old Testament already existed by the time they were written. So it's pretty straightforward as, as far as that goes. But the earliest manuscripts we have the subject all seem to be in, of Christian origin, not Jewish origin. And so that, okay. that enters into that. Okay? Thank you. You're most welcome. Have a great day. You too. All right. Bye-bye.